Let me go through my own list real quick. Um, so I feel like I'm earning my money, you know. <laughs> um, I, I started thinking up, so I, the language didn't need to change. You know, and I think the fact that of everything that we've talked about, that's probably been the least controversial topic that's come up in the last few days. Um, immediacy of the music and accessibility of the services have brought about many new Christians. I think we can't deny the fact that the rise of this new form of worship has meant not only the world, but eternity for countless thousands, uh, me included. Um, uh, I think it's reinvigorated congregational mm -hmm. singing. Mm -hmm. And I think the reestablishment of praise as a central liturgical was a major contribution. Because if you take a look at classic liturgical forms over 2,000 years, when Christians didn't know what else to do in a service, they reverted, the default setting was revert to praise. And so that emphasis, I think, very, very important. And then there's an interesting sort of both ecumenical and global connections. I mean, it's quite striking. I was in, where was I? El Salvador last December teaching Methodist pastors down there. And they started worshiping. I knew exactly what to do. You know, notwithstanding the fact that the specifics of the lyrics were largely inaccessible to me, I knew exactly what to expect. I knew exactly how to participate. You know, and, and, and it would be reciprocal if they came here. So, downsides. Um, I think, and we haven't talked about this, I think the reduction of word worship to music mm -hmm. is a downside. Yep. Um, there are times when I hesitate to tell people I'm a worship professor <coughs> because then the next question is, well, what instrument do you specialize in? Yeah. 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 And when I say <laughs> I don't say it. Actually, I have to I, I play Jim Bay and Congos in a small praise team for eight years before moving to North Carolina. Okay. A very acoustic sort of environment that we were doing. Or even perhaps more problematic is what I hear sometimes. Worship equals mood. Which is the downside to this whole Thanksgiving to praise to worship sort of thing. Where worship, you know, in the original Latter Rain teaching is action, but it's so closely tied to how do you assess when you're actually there and you're assessing God's. Um, you know, so I've had students talk to me about, I don't really like a service until I can get into a worship group. <laughs> and as a church historian, you know, if you try to apply that category across 2,000 years, it's like, that doesn't make sense to the vast majority of Christians who've ever existed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this privatization of worship, mm -hmm. uh, the concert line and we, but the whole ability to access worship music through <clears throat> iPods, MP3 players, CD players, you know, so that there's advertising, um, you get in your car to worship. And, you know, and so there's a potential privatization there. Uh, the taking away congregational singing, we've already mentioned that. Uh, the diminished prayer diet. And that came up a little bit when I was doing my uh, song assessment. If y'all don't want to type this out, this, these are all available on my gallery website. Um, diminished scriptural diet. I mean, I've noticed just in the, what I've presented and what we've talked about, the whole question about how many scriptures do you read, which scriptures do you read, what, what do you preach on? Um, you know, what contemporary worship has meant in terms of our use of the Bible is a, I, I think is a potential downside and is an often overlooked topic. The marginalization of pastor as worship leader. I mean, I have a favorite story. In Asbury, I was teaching my history of Christian worship class once. And about three weeks into the course, a student came up to me and said, oh, Dr. Ruth, I'm finally getting what you're saying. Well, I, you know, I said, well, Fred, what was it? He says, you're telling me the pastor is a kind of worship leader, too. Again, thinking 2,000 years, 
just that, that that was novel to that student would have struck virtually all Christians for 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. that, where in the world did that guy get that opinion? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And, and this even works. Does the pastor have to be in the space for the entire service? Mm -hmm. I mean, if I was still pastoring, as a matter of conscience, that would be something that I would insist upon for myself. Mm -hmm. I can't just show up in time and give the sermon. And conversely, I wouldn't dismiss the musicians to go back to the green room. After yeah. right. right. the set's over. Right. Right. Um, this reinforced hyper Christocentrism. And then let me, you know, you paid good money to be here, so let me throw in some um, <laughs> fancy words. So this hyper Christocentrism, I mean, this. This phenomenon really does strongly devotionally attach to Jesus. So this is a new word, patri superfluidity, <laughs> which is the superfluousness of the Father. And so pneuma superfluidity is the superfluousness of the Holy Spirit in the actual content of worship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lester, yeah. you know, Torrance says something about this, doesn't he? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We sort of become Unitarian in the way we worship. Oh, we're functionally Unitarian, right. is his yeah. phrase. Functionally yeah. Unitarian. Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, if you'll remember my exercise, and it's a really useful one for students. Have them read the book of Romans, a chapter a day for 16 days, first 16 days of the semester, and just have them note the God naming practices that Paul uses in the book of Romans. And then they will realize you can't talk about the saving work of Christ apart from talking about God the Father and the Holy Spirit if you want to do it in apostolic ways. And then the commercial <coughs> industries potentially not considering what's good for the church. And the, the commercial industrialization really, I mean, it started early, but especially it's gained steam in the last 20 years or so. I mean, I think some of us were even talking with CCLI being sold. Um, you know, will whoever's directing that whole enterprise now be operating with a commitment to welfare and the life of the church? And then finally, the loss of patience is a desirable virtue in worship in worshipers. And part of that's the consumerism of our age and how certain forms of contemporary worship uh, play into that. Part of it's the subtle spiritual formation that takes place in the actual content. But you know, do, do our ways of worship actually teach worshipers? that you may have to delay desire and you may have to delay fulfillment. And you may have to delay satisfying yourself in order to do a way of worship that's best for your neighbor. There's a, and this will be the concluding word. Um, there's a, a Roman Catholic ethicist, he's actually a friend of mine, James Kakamo. He's a, a moral theologian, he's an ethicist, who specializes in worship music. And so uh, he wrote his uh, dissertation and his some articles. What's the best kind of worship music? It's the worship music that helps my neighbor worship. And I'm afraid the whole phenomenon at its worst doesn't instill that sort of attitude.